to give you a very warm welcome to Professor Larry Phillips and to uh, Tim Gardner. And um, I, have an, I have an intro for Larry, but I don't have one for Tim because you've just joined us uh, right. quite late in the day, uh, right. Tim. So I don't actually have any formal words, but maybe you'll just say a couple of things about sure. yourself in a second. Sure. Um, but to uh, introduce uh, Professor Phillips uh, to begin with. So Larry is the Emeritus Professor and Director of the Decision Capability Group. Uh, and he specializes in helping decision makers to analyze complex issues involving uncertainty, risk, and multiple conflicting objectives. Larry's recent research describes the harms from the misuse of psychoactive drugs, opioids, and nicotine. Uh, that's just one of the things that you've done, uh, Larry. There are many, many other, um, other MCDAs than, than that. Um, he's now exploring ways to apply that research for the betterment of individual and public health, uh, which is why he's here today to speak to you. Um, and I hope you, uh, hope you get lots from the things that Larry has to offer. Um, and Tim, um, I'm just going to let you introduce yourself because if I try, I know you told me who you are, but if, you, if, you, if I try and do it, I'll probably get something slightly wrong. Um, so before Tim does that, please uh, welcome both Larry and Tim this morning. Thank you very much. Go sure. ahead, Tim. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. So Tim Gardner, I'm, I'm delighted to be supporting Larry this morning. I, I work for a company called Catalyze. Um, Catalyze is a spin-off from the London School of Economics, and Larry tells me it's the only spin-off ever from the London School of Economics. It's a decision sciences company, uh, and we do a lot of work um, now in the NHS. Uh, one of the most interesting things I think relevant to this group is a piece of work I'm leading at the moment on looking at the value of primary care mental health services and how do you establish the value it provides to the whole system and the cost efficiencies that it drives in the whole system. So from a buyer, an NHS buyer perspective, how is it that a certain type of model of care offers better value and better cost effectiveness across the whole system? But we're not talking about that today. Today we're talking about um, uh, a particular way of, of, of looking at the cost effectiveness of addiction treatment centres. Great, thanks. Okay. Smart decisions, that's what it's about. And Christoph tells me that some of you are facing some pretty serious smart decisions because, or needing to make smart decisions because, well, the, the real world tells us that resources are not unlimited. So I assume you're all working from limited budgets and it's very clear what the basis is for decision making when budgets are limited and that's what I want to talk about today and see if you find what you'll find in any corporate finance textbook, what you'll find in the Green Book, which is at the book that's published by the government to say this is how government agencies should prioritize things. I want to see if you believe this could be helpful to you because I haven't worked for uh, this organization before, though I have worked for charities in particular some years ago. I used this methodology to help Bernardo's charity to realign their resources to be more consistent with the rights of the child. So the rights of the child were the criteria against which we judged uh, the effectiveness of, of certain allocations of resource. Well, here, here are the key things about smart choices. There are three pillars. We've already heard about the first one, which you all know about. This is value. And I don't mean by value financial value, it could be that, but it's usually other things, and in particular, I'll ask you if the values that I, I dug out of Christoph were, would be satisfactory for the purposes of illustration today. The second one is uncertainty. Yes, we try to do what's going to create the most value, but we can never be absolutely sure that it's going to work. So uncertainty also needs to be accommodated. And finally, trade-offs. It's better to spend money, maybe less money in this area and more money in that area. And those are the three key features of all good decisions. Now I'm going to emphasize this several times and I'm only going to talk for a short time and then we're going to get involved in a, real, in a case study that uh, Christoph and I worked up for you. Okay, let's go next. All of this that I'm doing today is based on theory of decisions. 
Believe it or not, there, when I'm at a party and people ask, what, what do you do? I say, well, I'm, I teach decision science at the LSC. And they say, what? Decision science? Can there be a science of decision making? Well, the answer is yes, there can be a science. And there is a science. And it's over 50 years old. And it deals with all those three things that you've just seen in the previous slide. So I'm going to apply that. One of the people, Howard Reifa, wrote a book in 1968 called Decision Analysis. And the important thing, one important statement that I've taken from this book is this. The spirit of decision analysis is divide and conquer. Decompose a complex problem into simpler problems. Get one's thinking straight on these simpler problems. Paste these analyses to, together with logical glue and come out with a program of action for the complex problem. And that's exactly the process that I was going through a couple weeks ago with Christoph to try to take a complex problem apart into the pieces. Now, I may have done it wrong because I, I usually work with groups of people, and that's the next point. Um, no, the one after that, but that's okay, stay there. <laughs> This is uh, Decisions with Multiple Objectives that was eventually written by uh, Howard Rafer, who was a professor at Harvard, and that was his student then, uh, Ralph Keeney. And the next one? Uh, I have to tell you what we're talking about is going to be multi-criteria decision analysis, like when you have to buy a car or choose a school or a new home. You have to think about all different kinds of criteria. This is a picture that I actually took when I was traveling with my family in, in Colorado, uh, and we were driving in the country, and I, I, we were about to go, come in, go into a new, a very old gold mining town. The, the, the gold mine is long since finished. So it's called Gold Hill, and that was established in 19, 1859. Its elevation was 8,463 feet, and the population was 118. And now I'll reveal the rest of the thing, if you click again. Total, 10,440. OK. Everybody says, look, Larry, you can't compare apples with oranges. I'm not going to compare apples with oranges ever, because yes, they're incomparable. But what is comparable is the value of apples to the value of oranges. And that depends on context. If I'm making a Waldorf salad, I don't put up oranges in Waldorf salad, but I do put apples. So value is always context dependent, as you all know. So MCDA, multi-criteria decision analysis, converts all of the input evaluations of decision outcomes into the common currency of value added, extent to which an ob the objectives are met. That's what we mean by value. So you must have an objective to create the Waldorf salad, and it's met by apples, but not oranges. OK, simple. So let's go to the next one now. In addition to the technology, which is decision analysis, we also, I always work with groups. I have worked with so many groups. In fact, the, the methodology that I'm using here today was actually used to, to design uh, the Type 45 destroyer. There, there are six of those floating around now. Same methodology because it's all about allocating resources to get added value. But you have lots of different areas that you have to think about, and you put them all together with this MCDA stuff. But in the room, there were always between 20 and 30 people representing the customer who has to build it, the customer who has to use it, the civilian staff who know more that operational research, oh, there were a whole host of, rep, of, of and as well as some commercial companies uh, to contribute, not their solutions, but to get an idea of what capability we wish this ship to have. So that's what we're going to do. A decision conference is a one to three day workshop, and it's to resolve whatever important issues you're facing. You will be facing resource allocation problems, of course attended by the key players who represent a diversity of perspective. I want people to disagree. Very important that we get all the perspectives into any given model. And I facilitate it impartially. Uh, I don't have any stake in the, in the outcome, though I want a, an outcome. And I, use it, I, I only do a good enough job of modeling. No, no model can, 
do everything, but at least it can do enough that will be helpful to the decision maker. So the point is not to come up with the right decision. It's to come out with a deeper understanding of the problem so that the decision maker can make a really good, smart decision. Okay, and next. Here's the key. This is the most important slide in the deck. <clears throat> Prioritizing is based on what's called the priority index in a, any corporate finance textbook. And there it is. On the one hand, you have benefit. But when you multiply that by a probability of success, probabilities are less than one, so that reduces the benefit slightly. This is, by the way, why I don't do the, the weekend gambling to, for the prize draw. Because although it's a huge huge possible win, it has this minuscule probability and you multiply one by the other and it's actually less than the cost of a ticket. So to me, it's, it's not worth it unless, of course, that's when your, your, your objective is to win. If your objective is just to have fun and get the buzz of watching, then maybe it is worth it. Okay. So it depends on the criteria and the trade-off between them. So we've got the risk-adjusted benefit, and now we divide that by the cost, and that gives us value for money. Interestingly, many organizations prioritize things on the value, and they go down the list until they run out of money. That's wrong. They should always look to see what is the value and how much does it cost, because a big costly item has a very flat triangle, and that money could probably be used better somewhere else. Okay? So there's the priority index, and if you click again, we use multi-criteria decision analysis to combine all of the benefits into one preference value scale for each project, and I'm going to actually take you through the process of doing that. And then we risk adjust it by multiplying the two together, Probability adjusted benefit divided by cost. That's what you need to remember. You can do this on a spreadsheet. List what you want to spend money on. List the costs. Put next to the... Then now, now decide how you're going to value them. Maybe just by saying, here's the best one, here's the worst one, and that's what we're going to do today. Um, at any rate, you'll see a, a, a methodology for doing exactly all this. <clears throat> okay, next. Let me give you an example so you'll be more clear about it. One of my colleagues at the LSE once worked with the PCT at the Isle of Wight, and they had these various areas to allocate money. All the little white blocks are projects, and all the things that are at the bottom are the areas. So, there were projects that would affect children, like obesity training, projects that would have something to do with cancer, with mental health, with cardiovascular and respiratory. So those are the main areas of their, they were thinking about several years ago. So we, we often think about this as our cityscape. Uh, we'll develop a simple cityscape for you today. So that provides the basis for allocating all the uh, resources, and that was an additional one million pounds that was going to be spent on these possible projects uh, back in 2008 to 2012. The objectives were to increase health, that's less mortality, more quality of life, reduce health inequalities, and they had to be operationally and, and politically feasible. That's the probability of success idea. So, and the next one, eventually what we develop from all of this is a little triangle for every one of the white blocks. And then we stack the triangles up on top of each other in declining slope. So here at the very beginning is a very inexpensive thing and it gets you quite a long, quite a big risk adjusted benefit. And then you're spending a little more and a little more, da -da 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 -da. there's quite a bit, but you get a lot for it. Way up here, you're spending an awful lot to get quite a lot. There, you're spending a lot to get very little. So you can see that these are the things that you probably wouldn't spend. And if you have a one million pound limitation, if you go to the next one, then that's 
the best thing to do. We call that the frontier point. That's what you, everything from here down, those are the things that you could afford and you're going to get a lot of benefit, probably as much benefit as if you had spent every, a, a great deal more money, like 5,000 pounds. So you, the fact that this is nice and curvy means that there are some opportunities there. What was the F again? The what point? The F, a frontier point. We sometimes call this the efficient frontier. There's nothing up here, no cheap things that giving you a lot. But on the other hand, there are no really, really expensive things that give you very little. So the green area is where all possible combinations, I forget how many there are. Oh, yeah. The F project and the seven to the left cost just about one million. I, th I seem to remember there were nearly 3,000 possible combinations of those, those projects. Okay. Now, on to the next. And that's the, that's the successful frontier. In other words, for children, uh, no additional funding, nope. It's obesity training and this. It's these two. Here it's just this one. And here it's all those and so forth. So you quickly get an idea of what would be the best resource. If you had a little bit more resource, that would be the next thing you'd fund. And the last thing you funded was, was there. Okay, that went down. So now you begin to at least get a rough feeling for what's going on. And uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, somebody said prevention has to be included. We can't, we, we must put that in. So I said, okay, we can do that with the software. So we forced that in. But of course, that was quite expensive. And so these are all the things you're now going to have to give up in order to pay for prevention. Trade-offs. Serious trade-offs. And next. So how do, I said this is going to be a multi-criteria model. And you push again. We're going to use groups of experts, specialists, people who are concerned about what's going to be done. And it's those two things together. So I call this a socio-technical process. Yeah? Sorry, we, we've got a, sorry, we, we're recording, so it would be useful if uh, we could give you the microphone. Oh, back in the corner. But your model does not include the users. Is, I don't think that's coming through. Is the switch on? Testing, testing. Okay. Um, but your, in, in your social piece, you don't use the users of the services. Could put it, if you've got users, then fine, use them. Okay, but that would be, be in the group. The group. But, well, it may not. So somebody has to speak on behalf of the user, and who else but people like yourselves who are actually in touch with them. Yes, of course. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, let's go on to the next. So, in summary, please think triangles. If you don't remember anything else, just remember this is the best way to allocate resources for anybody, but particularly important for charities. And next... Here are the things that you can look at, and you'll get these slides. This tells you the, the, the basis for all of this. It doesn't tell you about the, the prioritization. This book will tell you about prioritization <coughs> in chapter 14, but it's a good thing to read chapter 3 first or to read this because you can download this for free. And this tells you more about value. <coughs> and if one of you could get me a drink of water, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so I think that's all. Now, I handed out to you um, something that Christoph and I worked on a few weeks ago, <coughs> which is a case study, and I'd like to just shut up while I get my drink of water and let you read that through so that you get a better idea. This is a, a hypothetical organization called Ad Treatment. It has three sites. 
And each of those is, um, good, thanks very much. Each of those sites has a different number of beds. Site two is actually two buildings. So you read through while I clear my throat. Um, but you get the idea of ad treatment. And it's three sites, and it's got different opportunities at each of the three sites. OK, so you can switch on. Good. Anybody have any question then about There should be lots of questions, but normally if I were in a decision conference, this is the point where people would be explaining what they're doing at each of their sites. And I have to tell you, the ability to actually write a two-page brief is the hardest part of all. It's just getting clear about the structure of the problem, because as you notice from the ad treatment two-pager, compared to the one page where I've got some specific options, and some costs. How did I get there? That was not easy. So now what I want to do is show you here on the model what is in the second handout. <clears throat> this is a piece of software called Equity, and it is one of the MCDA trademark uh, uh, programs that is um, able to do multiple sites multiple areas, as you saw with the one that I showed earlier. Each of these columns is basically a budget category. You have a budget for site one, you have a budget for two, and you have a budget for three. So how are you going to use that budget? That's the first step in trying to think about this, budget categories. And these are the options. Now, you'll notice that for site one, the status quo, by the way, as you go up, usually there's more expenditure in all of these columns. So this is the status quo. Christoph said we can't do less than that. We have to do that because the head office is there as well. Uh, but there are two counselors and, and, and two uh, um, social, workers. social workers, yeah. Um, Support workers, sorry, support workers, not social workers. <clears throat> uh, I, I did a lot of work for the European Medicines Agency many years ago from 2009, 10, and 11 on a project to help them make better decisions in about approving drugs. And the first thing they gave me was about 24 double-sided A4 pages that had nothing in it except acronyms. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> So that's the status quo. That's site one. But Christoph thought that there was a lot that could be done to do some staff training of these people, get them more trained up. In fact, when we met in this hotel a couple weeks ago, there was a training program going on. But he also thought if he had more money, he would like to provide more aftercare. Okay. So that, those are just the few options. There are many more on those on that two-pager. There's, there's a lot of stuff that's basically irrelevant to resource allocation and prioritization. Now, when we look at site two, I, I said I'd like to get down as far as possible, and he said we could, though I wouldn't like it, close this facility. If you then had, and that, at the moment, the status quo is two cottages, a half a counselor, and one of, of these workers. So if you go up to that, well, if you close the facility, he could maybe make one work. But with a little bit more resource, he, he could end up like this. So more resource, more people. Because obviously staff are, are the major costs that are involved here. Yes, there are other things are operating a hotel, but operating a hotel is common to whatever. You, that is, depends upon how many people you've got. That, that's the consequence. Over here in site three, the status quo was one and a half counselors, an 80% person here, and we got outpatient service. That would be a cutback. If we had more money, uh, 
we would go into specialist behavioral treatment. And he thought this was quite important. So with more money that, with less money. Okay, so you see there are different ways of thinking about how you would allocate resources to this problem. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let me take you through what we do next. And I'm going to ask you to provide me with the judgments. So let's start by um, doing the scoring at site one. Okay, I think everybody can see this. Can, I tried it before. Here, now top to bottom is what's been listed bottom to top underneath. And you'll notice that I've already put the costs down, which are in more detail on that second page, so you can read that off. Now, I, I want you to think first about recovery. And uh, with a right click on recovery, we should be able to see what the definition is. Extent to which the option helps clients to get better from the holistic treatment that they're given. Now, in a decision conference, we would probably have a big discussion about this. And you can if you want, but we've got to get through this as well. <laughs> I have only an hour left. Is that a good enough statement of an objective, of a criterion against which you could, say, you, you could look at these three levels? Let's try it. Everybody think about these three levels and tell me which one is going to be the best for recovery. Now, I'm an impartial person here, but the logic tells me that it must be this one because it includes that and that. Remember, these are additive as you go down. That's the status quo. You're doing more and even more. So I presume that for recovery, this one would be a 100. Now, we're going to use a scale here, 0 to 100 scale, where 100 is the best thing and 0 is the worst thing. Now, let me point out that 0 doesn't mean there's no value. But I would guess that this is 0 because that's less than that, and this is more than that. So this must be 100, and that must be 0. But that doesn't mean it's no value. You know, zero degrees Celsius doesn't mean no temperature. Zero degrees Fahrenheit doesn't mean no temperature. It's just an arbitrary least good. So that's least good, and that's the best for recovery. Ah, but now where would you put extra stra staff training? Would it be closer to 100 or closer to zero? Closer to 100? See, as soon as you get two p points on a scale, you can begin to think, yeah, it's closer to 100 than it is to zero. And obviously, you would need to know more about ad treatment, and you'd need to know more about the counselors, and so forth and so on. But let's just give it a rough number. What do you think? 80. Shout out a number. 80. 80. 70. 70. 60. 60. 68. <laughs> Let's compromise on a 70, shall we? Let's put a 70 there. <laughs> now, again, what I normally do is say to people, think first what that number should be. Don't anybody say out loud. Then, I sometimes with a flip chart, will actually write 100, 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s. How many of you think it should be 100? How many think it should be a 90? And then I get the disparity of, of opinion. Eventually, I get to the point where I ask people to, to think about it, and then they just shout out numbers, and I listen for the lowest and the highest. You gave it the lowest. You gave it the highest. Why did you give it such a high number? Why did you give it such a low number? And out of that discussion, always the range goes, gets smaller, at which point taking the median, the middle value, is good enough, OK? Experts always disagree. I don't care what the area is. Medical, oh, I've worked with so many medical people. They always disagree. I've had two pediatricians arguing with one another about 
some of the numbers here. They thought they agreed when they were talking words, but as soon as they started giving numbers, they realized, no, they weren't in agreement at all. Okay, so that's a 70. Now, let's right-click on maintain to find out what that means. Extent to which the improvement is maintained. You're presumably concerned about that in addiction treatment. Again, is this one 100 and this one zero? You think so? No? Why not? Well, remember, the first one, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So that one is going, the status quo is going to maintain. Is there going to be any additional maintenance by staff training and providing aftercare? Yes. Yeah, well, then that one must be 100, you see, by logic. So that's 100, and that one's presumably zero because you're going to get a little more maintenance but by getting better trained staff. Now, where is the staff training going to take you between 0 and 100? Closer to 0 or closer to 100? <clears throat> closer to 0. Could be. Depends again. You'd need to know the staff, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, they are at the head office, so I presume these staff that you already have are fairly competent. So extra staff training would be good, but it's not going to be a huge increment. So let's give that a number something less than 50. Anybody give a suggestion? 20? I think when I look at it from a financial perspective, comparing the 9,000... Well, don't worry about the money. No, I just wanted to add to that. I'd, I'd put it probably 25, but then I'd, what I'd need to know is what value I'm getting. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. What value you get for 9,000... Pounds, yeah. I mean, obviously, you think about this. If that had been, you know, <laughs> tuppence halfpenny, then <laughs> this would be worth nothing. But that's 9,000 pounds of training per year on staff, so that's something. Let's just give it a 20 to see if that yeah. works. Okay. <clears throat> now, it's, I found, in, particularly in working in, in um, healthcare areas, you should be doing things in such a way that you're also enhancing how you can do things in the future. So let's take a look at the definition of future potential. Extent to which the option provides flexibility to adapt to changed demands and social conditions. That's what you're experiencing now. Will these help that? Now again, if we look here at future potential, Am I guessing right to think that doing all three things is going to be better and just staying at the status quo is going to be worse? So that's bottom one is 100. The top one is still zero. What is staff training going to be doing? Presumably that is in part to help them to adapt, isn't it? So that you don't just keep doing things all the time. Does that make sense? That's sort of what I heard from Christoph, but makes sense to you? Yes. Okay. So um, what, what do you think? The, the number is more than 50? Yeah? So what do you think? Give it a number. 80? 80. Okay, let's give it an 80, because that, that is actually one of the purposes of staff training to make. Okay. Now, <clears throat> here's the hard one. These are all probabilities of success. We've got them at 100% at the moment. That's the default in the, in the program. Um, it seems to me that probably the, the one that is the most sure is the top one. That's probably, you know, if you carry on like you are, then, well, to what extent are you going to be able to maintain whatever level of value you've got here, here, and here. Well, maybe not so good there, certainly modest maybe there, but you know, recovery is what you're doing anyway. So 
maybe the probability of success is not surely 100%. Damon Runyon, the famous New York columnist and writer, used to say, when gambling on a sure thing, be, make sure that you save pocket money for the taxi home. <laughs> so though we give this a, a, something less than 100%, Yeah, it's got to be less than 100. And actually, these are probably increasing it, right? Yeah. So maybe the 100, we don't have to have a 100, though. Probabilities can be anything. So I presume that we're not terribly well positioned, particularly for these two. But we have a pretty good chance of maintaining, but they are the least good things anyway. So yeah, we'll have a good chance of maintaining the least good. But we got to leave some higher probabilities. But maybe not. Maybe the staff training won't work, and maybe the aftercare is not going to make any difference at all. Oh, well, that's your, you know, I'm not an expert in this, so I don't know. I don't know where the, where the best number is. What do you think? <clears throat> yes? What, what strikes me is, are we talking long-term or short-term? Because we're, for the moment, we're talking long-term for future potential. We're, ta we're talking more short term for recovery and maintenance, but maintenance really does mean that it's, we, we haven't specified that, and I would be very careful that we do do that if we were doing this for real. I guess because, because I've seen a lot of programs that start out really well, and then they continue to do what they were always doing, even though the client and or the available evidence-based treatment changes. Okay, well, that's a good argument for putting into all of these a time horizon. Yeah, okay. yeah, thank you. I didn't do that. I should have. But you could do it. So, so let's, let's recovery. Well, I don't know. How, how quickly do you learn when people have recovered and stayed? Well, just they've recovered. That's fairly rapid, isn't it? Within months. Maintenance is a longer term, and future potential is even longer. Yeah? So we, we would put some numbers there against the years and, and, and think about it that way. Anybody got a some suggestion for any probability here? 60, 70, 80. 60, 70, 80. Okay, so it's starting reasonably well. 60, 70, 80. Let's try that, see what happens. Okay, well, we just did that for site one. Now we're going to repeat it for site two and for site three. Okay, so save it. Or you probably already did save it, hey? <laughs> All the way at the bottom, there you go. Okay. Well, let's have a look. You can close the future potential thing over here, Tim. That's great. I think we, the definition of recovery, uh, maintenance, and future potential is also at the bottom of my second handout, so if you forget it. Okay, let's have a quick go on all of these. These are different amounts of money than you saw before, and, and presumably closing the facility is the worst thing. And presumably, since that's only one cottage, and this is two cottages, I guess this must be better, right? So that must be a 100 down there. Well, how do you want to position one cottage versus two? Above 50 or below? About 50. About 50? Yeah. OK. Now how about maintenance? Presumably, again, it's a zero at the top and a 100 at the bottom. By the way, zero this time really does mean no value. <laughs> so what would you give one cottage for maintenance? You have 50 plus you're adding some staff, so maybe 60 altogether. 60 altogether? Okay. Sounds good. And now future potential? Presumably more there. How much have you got with one cottage? Maybe less than 50 this time, wouldn't it be? 30? Okay, give it a 30. Mm -hmm. 
Oops. Yeah, that's another way I could get at it, but <laughs> I'm trying to keep it simple today. Yes? Can I just ask why does the second option, one cottage, have one and a half councillors and the third option, two cottages, have half a councillor? Well, don't forget that... Um, Oh, I think I should have said this is it this this actually includes that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I forgot the plus sign. Thank you. Um let's, which was your, which of these is the most successful do you think? Three. Three. But not 100% surely. Something like 80. 80 maybe. Okay. And Actually, this is 100 because, yeah, you're absolutely sure that if you do nothing, you will get nothing. <laughs> so maybe that's a 90. Yeah. Oh, no, it can't be, can it? Because, oh, uh, no, it must be less than 80. Sorry, it must be less than 80 because it's a smaller facility. And then you get up to 80. Yeah, so maybe 70 or 80, something like that. Okay. So let's close that, and now we could do the last one, site three. Here we go. Now this time the status quo is in the middle. So which of those is best for recovery? Probably this one, isn't it? Because that's in addition to the status quo. And this is a cutback to the status quo from the status quo. So that one's, that one's just an outpatient service. You don't even have the as many beds anymore, so so that's the least good. But what what is one and a half counselors and an eighty percent um, support worker? I guess it must be closer to the one hundred, isn't it? It's more around seventy-five, eighty. Okay, let's give it a 75. For maintenance, probably adding specialized staff. That's the whole point because it's behavioral uh, training. And presumably that's a, a zero. I don't know how close. This, this one must be fairly high, actually. I would I think more than 50, logically. What do you 80, give it an 80? Okay. And the future potential clearly must be best with the specialized staff. And it's probably fairly good with the status quo. 70 or 80, something like. Okay. Now, probability of success, what will we give there? Zero. Yeah, that's, you've lost a lot, haven't you? So that's a zero, I think. Well, not a zero, no, that you will get some recovery maintenance and future potential just from the outpatient service. So you're gonna get something, it's probably pretty, pretty good. Um, interesting that. A zero probability means it will fail. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Zero, that's right, Tim. Yeah. Zero probability means it's certain to fail. Give it a 30, maybe. <laughs> Give it a 30, okay. And, and currently, how well are you doing on these three things? Well, you're doing, you're scoring it high. You're already doing it, so that's probably pretty high. A 90. And, well, the specialized staff, that's probably less than 90, that by itself. Uh, well, let's see, it's on top of that, so that's already 90. So maybe, 80 and 90. Oh, maybe that's 80 and 90. Yeah, that's a good point. By the way, do you see how just logic dictates some of these things? It, it, it helps if you know what you're talking about, and that's why I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head. Okay, so now we have... This is the process of scoring, okay? And we're doing quite well. Now, 
The next point is to do trade-offs. You've been thinking not at all about trade-offs. So now we have a different one. That's it. We have to fill this matrix with trade-off judgments. And let me tell you how we do it. If you'll close the criterion recovery over here, and you need to reduce the size of that a bit, um, uh, even the, uh, put it down to about 12, I think. That's great. And I, then we park this over here. All right, now I'm going to ask these questions in a new way. Hey, hey, wake up. <laughs> Follow me. <laughs> I want to ask these questions in a new way. Um, that little box that's got a square, a rectangle around it, is for site one, and we're talking about recovery. Okay? I want you to tell me how big is the difference in recovery between the status quo and the status quo and everything. So you're thinking about the actual difference here and how much you care about that difference. For site one compared to the difference for site two. Which of those is a bigger difference that you care about? The status quo compared to status quo plus staff training plus providing aftercare, that, that's quite a bit. Compared to closing the facility and maintaining the status quo, which of those is going to be better for recovery? Which is the bigger increment in recovery? Or are they equal? You have to remember that how many people, you've got two counselors here, and here you've got two cottages, and you've got two counselors again. Uh, you've got about the same staffing, but it's split between two here and it's the same there. So all those considerations to be taken into account. This is a big city, this is not. Anybody have a guess about this? What I would normally do if ad treatment were a real group is to get now the senior people who have an oversight of all, the, all these sites. And I would get them to make judgments about these weights. These are, this is a process now of weighting. We want to weight the difference in recovery here compared to the recovery there. You kind of can't have site two without site one, so it's weighted in site one. Yes, th that's what this is about. That, well, at the moment, I'm just asking which of these is the bigger difference? Site one. Yeah, site one, I think probably that's right. Now, compare site one with site three. Outpatient serve. Here, here you've got, well, here you've got a, a curious one. You have to just think about the biggest one over here, um, which was this. It's. This plus specialized staff includes the status quo. So those two together, presumably, are bigger than just running an outpatient service. So how does that compare with the difference over here? Still here? Yeah. Okay, so that justifies a 100 up there for site one. So if that's a 100, how big is this difference over here, the two site? Hard thinking about, isn't it? The, the, the first time you go through this waiting process, it's always a bit puzzling. Eventually, you think, oh yeah, of course, I get it now. But Okay, the penny would drop eventually. So what do you think about this one? How big is that difference? 
That's right, you've got 12 beds. That's a good point. We've got more beds over here, so that's another reason for giving this a big weight. So maybe an 80 for that. And how about site three? The difference between the status, sorry, outpatient, just an outpatient service plus this with the number of beds that I've listed. Is that, <coughs> is that number bigger or smaller than 80? Sorry? Smaller? Smaller? Like what? 40? Might be 40. Okay, we'll give it a 40. Now that was just for recovery. Now let's repeat the process for maintenance. Which of these differences is biggest for maintenance? One again? Or, or is this specialized staff that's doing behavioral stuff, is that going to enhance this? I mean, they're not doing as much here anyway because you only got one and a half counselors and 80% uh, support service. So probably it's over here, isn't it? So let's give that one 100. And how much does site two? That's the same number of staff, but split in two ways. For maintenance, it's probably less than 100. Make a guess. I, I think it's really hard with recovery rates and maintenance rates in addiction. So um, if there is no aftercare, then it's very likely that the recovery won't be maintained. Oh, I see. So, yeah. it, it, so that one's got to be less than 100. Yeah. OK. Like what? You don't know? Zero. zero. Well, it can't be zero because there's going to be some maintenance in the. Because here you're closing the facility yes. versus that. So that's a big jump. Yeah? We're looking at this difference. Right. Yeah. Where we were. Yeah, we but were you're looking sorry. at people maintaining their recovery. Is yeah, that it's what the difference you're doing? between closing the facility. <laughs> and maintaining with this level of support. But that's whilst they're in the facility. This maintenance is afterwards, after they've left. That's right, that's right. But is there, but there must be some maintenance here. Is there? Isn't there? You've got two counselors and half a, and another half, a, oh, two cottages, a, half a counselor. Well, maybe there isn't any maintenance there. That's a possibility, I suppose. Although you didn't score it that way. Yeah. So I think we have to give it something, but I don't know what. Like a 20. Sorry? 20, 25. Okay. Give it a 20. That's fine. And now uh, site three. That's the difference between these two together versus just an outpatient service. I don't know what that does for maintenance. Do you have any idea? I'm way out of my depth now. A lot. A lot. You get quite a big difference. Yeah. yeah. So it's bigger than 20, but less than 100. What would you think? 80. 70, 80? 80, 80. Okay. Now, future potential. What is the future? Which one's got more future potential? Which difference has got more future potential? I assume it's this one because you're doing a lot here. So it must be the first one. There's 100. And here you've got the difference between closing the facility. That's quite a big difference. This is a modest thing with a, also with specialized staff. Maybe this and this are almost equal. Could be, I suppose. What would you think for future potential? Is it as big as this difference? Anybody got a guess? 80? Possibly. 
Okay, give it an 80. And site three is this combination. How does this combination look to you? You're getting some future potential because of the specialized behavioral training. Actually, maybe you might even be getting, well, of course, there's only one and a half counselors and only a partial support worker, so. But, but, the, the, but actually, we're bringing in some specialized staff here. I didn't put down. That might be 80 as well, yeah, so for, for different reasons, yeah. Okay, and now um, the probability of um, the probability of success is always a very difficult one to do in terms of trade-offs. Um, basically, we're, we're kind of looking at the difference. Does this have a big impact on the probability of success? In other words, over here, we're trying these are all very good things to have happen. And you don't want to make these numbers too low or you'll kill it because <laughs> it kills all these numbers. But basically, how confident do you feel about those three numbers? I would say you probably feel fairly confident because that's what's happening now. And more. So I might, if I were just doing a confidence, I might give that at close to 100. Maybe site two. I'm not claiming too much. I'm claiming quite a bit here and not very much there. It seems to me that you probably will be able to achieve those. So that one might be a, a bit lower, 70 or so. And site three, well, <clears throat> it's the difference between a modest effort here and some specialized staff. Do you think the specialized staff is going to have these kinds of impacts? Could do. <coughs> so that one's probably what? 80 or 90? Okay, so let's leave those. And now, I got, this is the really tough one. We want to compare this 100 with this 100 with this 100. Is the trade off? <laughs> between two things, the biggest for recovery or for maintenance. At least these 100s are all in the same site. That helps a lot. When they're different sites, it gets very mind-bogglingly difficult. I presume that since this is what you're doing now anyway, that's pretty high. That's probably the highest, isn't it? Maintenance. How are you doing in maintenance at the main? There's some aftercare, there's some training, and it's two counselors and two staff workers. So, so okay. I, I don't know how good this is, how, how, how well people are doing on maintenance. You can see why you need to know actually what goes on at these centers before you can answer my questions. It's otherwise it's getting very hypothetical now. I would say for maintenance it's pretty high, something 80, 90, 85 maybe. Yeah, 80 or 90 sounds about reasonable, 85. And which one is how how is what's the future potential here? Maybe maybe not quite as good as it might be over here where you've got behavioral training as well. So something less probably than 85, huh? 70? OK. That's done now. Right. Everything's finished. You did first the scoring, where you did individual things. Then you did the weighting. Now we have to put it all together. And what we use is logical glue. Every, all the mathematics behind this is just weighted averages of the numbers that you've. The weights are the latter things that you did. The things that you're weighting are the scoring, are the scores. So you're just multiplying one by the other, just as I did for my lottery decision, right? Huge amount of money times the probability of it. It's uh, tiny. Okay, so that's what's happening over here. 
Um, now, the first thing I would like to find out is what amount of money you're spending now. So, Tim, if you could choose by clicking on that uh, P up there, that's it. And we're going to choose the status quo in site one. Oh, no, sorry, I'm wrong. Click, click, click it again. <laughs> Turn it off. Yeah. Click the top. The top, provide aftercare. We're going to do all of those things. So all of those things would be, oh no, sorry, it's just the status quo. I got it wrong. Just the status quo. Now, click the status quo over here and click the status quo over here. There we go. All right. Now, if you uh, get out of that uh, by... Uh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to click click on the one that has the P and the blue and the red to the right, to the right. More. That. There we go. Now, we're, we've got the status quo in all three sites. And we are actually sp spending 274,000 pounds to do it. However, the computer has found a better package which for the same cost, actually a little less cost, oh sorry, those were the costs. Here, here are the benefits over here. You're spending 274,000 to get benefits of 410 out of 1,000. However, you could, by spending 218, a cheaper package, you could be getting more benefit. So you could spend less money and get more benefit, or a bit more money, 323 instead of 274, and get a lot more, 751. Well, what on earth is that? So if you close this now, we'll find out. So let's look down here what it says. Well, these, these are the proposed packages. But what it's choosing in site three is to, <laughs> how did we get three P's over there? No, it's correct. Oh, I, because it's cumulative, of course. So you keep this one open, you stick there and carry on there. Let's take a look at the efficient frontier. Let's look at the triangles all stacked up next to other, to the right. That's the, that, that was the individual one, just close the one on the left. Oh, the areas are not sorted properly. Oh, ho, ho, we have a problem here. Okay, so, yeah, use that one that you were just doing yeah. to the left of the green spodge. To the left, to the left, left. Yeah. No, you're going right. The other left. The other left. The other that's left. it, yeah. that's it. No, now click on... The, the one above the word S in previous. <laughs> there, that's it. Now, what we're seeing here is the site three graph. And you see you can spend a lot of money from one to get up to two, but you have to spend more money to get up to three. And now click on the yellow arrow, arrow and you'll go to, to two. And this says you're at one. If you close the facility, one cottage, you'd get something. But this one is steeper, so they're not in the right order. So, okay. Now go to left again. And that is okay. Small triangle and then a... Okay, so if you close, close that, and you now go up to... Uh, see the... Oh, yeah. This is the one where there's a stack with an up and down sort area. Okay, so do that and just say okay. It's all right, and that's okay. So it's now changed. The, it was kind of stupid. To, either you do two sites or you do none, right? That's basically what it said on the basis of your judgments. Oh, so now what we've got. You should be at this. You should pr do all these things in in number. So here's what you're proposing, the status quo. But it says no. Provide more 
aftercare. That's the better position. And up here, go up to the status quo, but stay at the status quo over here. Now, this sounds kind of odd, so I want to look at the, the efficient frontier. No, to the right. That's it. Oh, I thought we already sorted them. OK. Oh, maybe they got sorted before when you clicked that. Oh, there we go. That's better yet. Yeah. Got it. This is where you're currently operating on the status quo, a little over 250,000 pounds. And you're getting almost 400 points. But if you do the, the B solution, it's cheaper and better. Oh, blimey. Move that all the way to the right. I've got to look at this one again. I was not expecting this result at all. Just move the whole thing. Yeah, that's it. Oh, you may have to click on the empty space. Oh, that's OK. All the way over if you can. That's it. Yeah, let's see what this B point is compared to the P point. There's the P. The P is to do all these. Oh, I see. Look. This now, that cottage thing wasn't right. Now it's basically telling you, just run one cottage. Do all the things over here and stay at the status quo here. So you're giving up one cottage in order to do these extra things. Yeah, that's the trade-off. That's the trade-off. Give up one cottage and you can f afford to do those things. And wow, that is a much better idea because you're spending less money and you're getting a lot more for it. Now you'll notice the next point up is a very gentle slope. So it's probably not very sensible to go up there. Does this feel right to you on the basis of what we were saying? All those numbers you were putting in, you're all feeling, of course, kind of. And yet, this is not the result I was expecting and nor was Christoph. Christoph thought it was going to close this facility altogether. But no, it says, don't do that. Drop back to one cottage, spend the money over here. That's the trade-off. Uh, now, this doesn't just require a lot more debates to make this more scientific. Absolutely. That's being out in the country, you get your labor cheaper. Absolutely. You might get different results, given the figures we put in. Absolutely. And you'll notice I just have a fixed cost for a counselor and a fixed cost. Now, I just made all those assumptions. But, this, but even this very simple model came up with some. Christoph's going to be quite surprised when he hears this. <laughs> Yeah, that's very good. Yes. Can I just ask, is, um, is the B the recommendation? Is that what the B stands for? The B is the better part on the efficient frontier, you see? You can't get better than that. Right, OK. Because the B is the two cottage option. Yeah, and C um, is a cheaper option, which gets, also gets more benefit Let's look at the cheaper option. It still says go up there, but it says close the facility and still stay there. Yeah. OK, so the, the B on site two is the two cottage. Yeah, the B, that, the B here says just run two the status cottages. quo. Just, two cottages. Just stay as you are. Yeah. Because yeah. that is. Well, I'm not sure why this is a P and that's a P. It looks like the benefit of keeping both cottages open 
is sufficiently great mm. that it justifies the extra cost there. Mm. Yeah, but that's basically the trade-off. Yeah, very interesting. Oh, I wasn't expecting that. But that's the point of modeling. Over and over again, I was telling Tim earlier that when we were doing the Type 45 destroyer, there was an intention of having 12. Every one of the towers was a different function, a radar function, a sonar function, a da 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 And you have various options from sort of very less expensive to more expensive options. And the intention was to have 12 destroyers. When I finally briefed this up to four-star level, and he looked at the cost on here that was the, that was the budget, you, you couldn't go higher than the budget, he discovered he was way down here on the left-hand side, and he wouldn't have any sonar, and he wouldn't have a gun on the front, and an inner layer defense system, and he actually got quite red in the face and said, I'm not going to sea without a gun. So we now have six destroyers instead of 12. In other words, what this does is bring home, and, and actually I, I had this facility for doing trade-offs. Let me just show you what happens. Let's suppose we, we close that. Oh, no, leave it. At, that's okay. Leave it. At. What I would like to do now, if you can get rid of the P on your, no, no, on your, that's right. Click on there to get rid of it on your your. Um, yeah. yeah, not. It's not there that I want. That's right. Get get rid of. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, display. Um, oh no, that's interesting. Well, here's another way we we, we could think about this. I, I've forgotten what I said. Was 247,000 was the status quo cost? Yeah. Okay. So go up to here and um, open the frontier. Uh, no, not that one. The one that to the right, the little green. One. Yeah. Let's look at the envelope. Um, I want to. I want to. I want to create a frontier point, but I can't figure out why it's not highlighted up here. Hmm. It's because you still have the cursor on the P. Click the P for at the right P at the top. Mm. Yeah. Does it get rid of that? Not yet. Right. Well, no, and let's stay with the proposed. Let, let's set the proposed again. There we go. Uh, and we've got the, oh, here we go. On the left-hand part of the frontier, that whole band that's got, there, display frontier, okay. There is the frontier to start with. You would do this, this, and this. And that's the F point over here. Now click on the F up arrow here in the middle, F up right there. No, to the left, <coughs> left, there. Click on that. Now it's moved up to the first thing you would do. It would be staff training. That's the highest priority. Now go up to the next point. Ah, now you do aftercare. Well, see, these two things won right away. They're very high priority. And now click again. And the, this point now is closing the facility, but we're still over here at the status quo. And the next thing up will be to, to go there. And that's the frontier position that we were actually looking at. And the very next point is that one. So you can actually see what the actual priority is by, by clicking, clicking, going up. There's also a list that I can show you, but that's really boring. And, uh, but this gives you a better sense of it. And now if we display, um, let's see, let's display the frontier package. That's this one. That's it. So the frontier package costs 255. And we could have 
we could enter any budget into this model and it would tell you where on the frontier, but it's, there are only so few points on it, it's not worth that trouble. And we're getting close to the, to the stopping time anyhow. So please go away thinking triangles. This is a more complicated, slightly more complicated way to think about these things. But I hope that you've got the idea that thinking triangles and the trade-offs between triangles is what's crucial. Oh, if I spent more money here and less money there, actually that would get me more benefit. That's the, the, the key that's behind all of this. And we do it all with simple, fairly linear mathematics. Anybody have a question that they'd like to raise now? Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. This uh, program you're using, is that, this program you're using, is that somewhere available? Oh yeah, it's avail Cat available at Catalyze. They have this program. They also have one that does the same thing. That's This one is designed to work with groups. Simple displays, big text, easily readable. But they also have another one uh, that I thought we might be able to use today, but it wasn't as nice on, on displays, so I decided to use this one instead. And that one is called Focus Plus. That's right. So, so all these programs are available on the Catalyze website. You can, you can trial them for a period of time. And then um, I think the crucial thing is how do you facilitate? It's not the tool that makes the decision. It's how do you create that decision? Now, I appreciate that the hard part seems like what you were doing here, scoring and waiting. But actually, once you've done this a few times, you, you say, oh, no, this is like learning a new language. And it's once you've got it, you've got it. it Any more questions? It does require quite a, lot of, quite a lot of stamina. You can imagine this, this was an hour and a half of, of scoring. But if, if it's a more complicated situation, it's, it's quite tiring to get through it. Um, but actually engaging service users in that process is, is really interesting as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've worked at the European Medicines Agency. I worked with experts from all over the, of Europe working together to model a drug compared to a placebo. And we use a simpler program than, the, than this one. But resource allocation is a tougher one. It's like having individual multi-criteria models for each of the sites and then gluing them all together by looking at the trade-offs between the sites as I did on that one trade-off thing. So yeah, it is more complicated. Yes, another question at the back. Have you done any work using um, propensity to extend, propensity to lapse? Yeah, say it again so we can have, get it on Sorry, screen. have you done any modeling around propensity to lapse, propensity to extend that type of modeling? I haven't done so, but I, I'm, so I'm, have you done anything? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so in terms of creating a criteria set in the first place, that's, that's really important to get that right. Yeah. And if, if propensity to, um, to, 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 to extend is, is one of the criteria that matters, then we have to find a way of factoring that in. And creating a criteria set which is, which is sufficient but not so complicated that you've got to go through 29 different scoring procedures, that's, that's the art. So you need to keep the number of criteria down to a manageable level, but also it has to be sufficiently rich to capture everything that matters. Sure. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm with the cabin out of Thailand up at Chiang Mai, and we're creating a customer lifetime value metric at the moment. Have you done anything around that? Yes. Um, uh, and this is work I'm doing at the moment to look at, um, I suppose, value in the widest sense around types of models of care, what, what matters, not simply uh, from, from the perspective of the patient, but also from the perspective of the system for, for keeping it you know, uh, sustainable in the longer term, um, because it's about keeping a, the, the, the most amount of good can you do for, for a whole population. And it's important to you know, recognise the individual but also we have to recognise some of the, 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 the benefits of wider um, access and wider and, and more robust and more sustainable um, engagement. So it's, it's all of those things which, which trade off. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, um, 
we need to call a halt, but we will be available. Can you tell us where we go next for those of you who want to ask more questions and dig into this further? Um, we'll have a couple of minutes here. Um, you can come up and ask um, questions if you like, but then I'll have to whisk the speakers off uh, for an interview. So um, okay. then you just have to perhaps meet other people in the Okay, so or, well, we got uh, just, uh, just two or three minutes yeah, left. Yeah, we've got a few minutes Any other now. question? But Tim and I will be around and if you bump into either of us. In, in fact, if there's more work to be done, you, Catalyze would probably be the right organization to do it. Okay? Any more questions? Nope? Okay, we're finished. Thank you.